to turn the uh, recording system on. Uh, so uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on where you are. Uh, the first thing to start with is that please be mindful that this is a, a open uh, conference and uh, uh, our discussions are going to be recorded and put on the YouTube. So, so you are not protected by the Chatham House rules. Uh, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Shenkun Lu, and people call me Lu. I'm the founder and also the CEO of Friends of Multilateralism Group, the FMG. So today we have a, a very a, a important meeting uh, on the WTO and China, based very much on the book by Pedro Andre. Of course, we all know that in the area of trade and WTO, much of the focus is around China uh, and its peculiar system, its role in the WTO after exactly 20 years uh, of its accession. And of course, we do see also beyond the WTO, they are also I think we've lost you, Lou. You're muted. I'd get started, Stuart, if I were you. Okay. Uh, there he is. He's come back in. Do you want, do you want me to go ahead, Lou? Yeah, go ahead. I think I got uh, cut out. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, yes, as, as Lou was uh, saying, you know, welcome to our um, Friends of the Multilateralism Group online brainstorming on this fantastic book by uh, Petros uh, Mavroidis and Andre Sapir on China and the WTO. And I think the subheading is really important too. Uh, why multilateralism matters, because that's where the book um, comes around to. So I think that's really important to remember that. Um, we have a great uh, program today, and I don't think I need to sp spend long at all on um, introductions, because all of our uh, participants um, are very, very well known in world trade and WTO circles. Um, we have got, first of all, uh, Petros Mavroidis, who is Professor of Law at the Columbia Law School, uh, and he's currently in New York. Thanks for joining us fairly early in your day, Petros. Uh, and of course, the uh, other author of the book, André Sapir, who is Professor at the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles and a senior fellow at uh, a very important think tank, uh, Brogel. Uh, and then uh, apart from our two authors, we've got two discussants, uh, Hido Huben, who of course is Deputy Permanent Representative at the EU Mission to the WTO. And uh, Hido's got a, a wealth of very interesting experience in relation to um, the US and Canada and TTIP and also the China accession. So thanks very much for joining us, Hido. And uh, Professor Tu Xinquan, who is Dean and Professor of the China Institute for WTO Studies at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. And Xinquan is actually a member of our group, so it's great to have him uh, with us today as well. Uh, the format is a little bit uh, different from uh, we originally advertised in that I understand that actually Petros is going to make the presentation and Andre is going to chip in and interject along the way uh, to supplement what uh, Petros says. Um, we're aiming for um, you know, maximum 30 minutes from, from Petros and, and, and Andre, and then we'll have 10 minutes each from the two discussants, uh, Hido and uh, uh, Professor Tu. And then after that, I'm hoping we'll get lots of questions from the audience. And looking at this audience, I think we, we should get lots of questions. So peel, please feel free to ask questions via the, um, the Q&A function. And uh, I think Lou will field those and, and feed those through. So that's more or less it. 
I don't want to take up too much time, but I, I just want to say by way of prefacing the discussion that for me personally, I love this book. It's a great book. Uh, it's got a, a, a broad historical sweep. Um, the discussion of the so-called gap liberal understanding is, is uh, certainly deepened my knowledge in that area. Um, and the, you know, the sections on the similarities and differences between the, the situation between the US and Japan in the 1980s and the current situation between the US and China and, and, and the US and China now is fantastic. The analysis of the main issues, particularly, of course, SOEs and, and technology transfer and, and how that might be fixed. Uh, and this idea of a, a sort of third way, as it's called, that's a much used phrase, I know. Uh, and it's used also in the discussions on um, the TRIPS waiver and, and trade and health right now. But I think the, the, the third way as used in the book is you know, to translate the gap liberal understanding into some form of treaty language. I think this is a very useful idea. And uh, last but not least for me, I mean, this, is, this book is incredibly readable. I think I read it at one sitting. Uh, it's very rare in a genre such as this to have such a readable book. So I, I really want to pay tribute to the two authors personally before we get into the discussion. It's, it's, it's great. Um, of course, this discussion takes place at a very, in a very, very timely uh, place because we've recently had China applying to join the CPTPP and um, maybe we'll get some questions on that and there's some discussion on that further down the line uh, because in the book, of course, uh, the CPTPP is held out as one of the possible inspirations for solving uh, some of the issues that, that confront the trading system right now. But that's enough from me. I don't want to go on too long. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to offer the floor to you, Petros, to pr make your presentation. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Stuart. Your praise is extremely high, and especially coming from you. To me, it means a lot um, uh, because I learned so much from you over the years, and I continue to learn. And I think my experience in this book with Andre is probably my best experience uh, writing a book together. So good that now we embarked on a new exercise on a, a different topic. So, whoops, this is the book. And uh, before I start, let me say just one word. You know, when we had the first draft, not exactly the book as it is, I sent it to one person who I thought would be the ideal uh, let's say, author, reader, and critic of the book, Gary Hafbauer, who's here with us. And Gary gave us amazing comments. So to a large extent, the structure of the book has been influenced by the input of Gary at a very early stage before we shaped the whole book. And I don't want to, I would be remiss if I could not recognize it publicly. Now, what is the argument of the book? China's trade uh, has grown since its accession extremely fast. Now, this is good, means the WTO works, China produces the goods, but the question has become over the years, well, what about state involvement of China? Is this consistent with the workings of the world trading system? So the question we ask in this book is, why those guys who put into question the role of state of China have taken approaches which have not worked why have they not utilized the WTO more? And what could we do to ensure that China, which well, we all agree is a pillar, a major stakeholder of the world trading system, will fare in accordance both with the letter and the spirit of the world trading system? And that's the key question of our book, the letter and the spirit. So we will divide our presentation into four parts. First, I'll discuss the terms of accession. And every time I finish uh, the short presentation, Andre will uh, provide his comments. Then the issues regarding China's participation, not our issues. And this is something sometimes people have misunderstood the point here. Andre and me did not invent the complaints. We took the complaints of uh, WTO members at face value. We looked at the disputes. 
and we looked at complaints before WTO committees. And we ranked them and then we said, okay, what do people complain most? And that's what we dealt with in the book. Then how much you can address of those complaints within the four corners of the WTO SCs, and there are responses, not much. And then our suggested approach, what should, could be done in order uh, to address those concerns. Assuming, of course, that these concerns are genuine. Now, one point here, sometimes people say, oh yeah, why would China agree? The, the point of the book is not how do you bring China to the table to negotiate? The point of the book is where should we go? Where should we go for the world trading regime to be a world trading regime that accommodates countries like China and the existing incumbents? Now, China enters the WTO, and I have to say that here, of course, and then myself, we have, uh, we're Monday morning quarterbacks. Uh, we have the benefit of hindsight, 2020 actually, because now we are 20 years after China has joined the WTO and over 30 years since the negotiation of, between China and the WTO has started. So we have a benefit that the negotiators, EU, US, everyone, Brazil, India, did not have when negotiating China's succession. So China accepted all multilateral contracts, all of them, of course, it had to, promised to negotiate government procurement, accession to government procurement, hasn't happened so far, but there have been ongoing negotiations, concluded the protocol of accession, nobody will uh, argue that the tariff cuts were very meaningful, and so, but we didn't see any additional hard disciplines, which there is an explanation. Uh, concerning regime change in China. And the best proof in our view is the fact that only section 15 has been cited in SOE related disputes before the WTO. Of course, the protocol of accession contains language which nudge China towards further reform, but the key thing is does not impose it. And as we'll explain later, cannot impose it either. Now, why don't we see more? Why didn't China become, let's say, US-like through the protocol of accession to the WTO. Uh, for starters, the US was quite happy with what happened. We found a lot of evidence in discussions before the US Congress, which can be summed up in this phrase, US changes nothing, we don't reduce our tariffs. China has to lower its tariffs joining the WTO. The uh, trade deficit uh, actually, <laughs> If you look at bilateral relations, US-China, it's a totally different picture in the 90s than nowadays. Everybody imagined a trade surplus. Moreover, both in the US and in the European Union, actually even the then DG of the WTO spoke along those lines, there was this belief that China was a one-on-one -on -one way street to become a market economy. And not only that, some in the US went ahead to say, these guys will become a liberal democracy even though China consistently said, I am a socialist market economy, not a market economy. The best proof again is by 2015, there is a clause in the protocol of accession. There is no presumption that China is a non-market economy. Everybody expected China by 2015 to be a market economy. Of course, this is buoyed by the zeitgeist of the 90s, Fukuyama, the end of history, the definitive win of liberalism, the fall of Berlin Wall. And this is probably, if you wish, the basis for the rational or irrational expectation back in the 90s. André. So hello, everybody. And thanks, uh, thanks Petros, for what you said. And thanks, Stuart, for your, for your kind words of, uh, of introduction. So at, at this stage, I, I only want to, uh, to underscore something that Petros has, has already said uh, towards the end of, of, this, of this part, which is this question of socialist market, uh, market economy. Um, I, think, uh, I think a recurring theme, both in the book and I think in our presentation today, is that market economy and socialist market economy is not the same thing. So uh, probably uh, the commitment that China made uh, in the uh, working uh, paper on the protocol of accession, 
which is about you know becoming a socialist market economy. Probably the word socialist uh, was uh, not noticed or understood uh, by uh, by everyone, and everyone focused on the market economy. He froze. Yeah, Petrus probably could just go on. Yeah, to the role of. Ah, oh, he's back. Okay, uh, Andre, we, we missed the last part because you froze. Okay, so go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Poor um, internet connection, I can see. Yeah, sorry, okay. sorry about that. No, don't worry about it. So, what are the issues? And I repeat, we start looking here more to the issues as. Um, uh, oops, what happened here? This computer is crazy. Okay. Now, China joins the WTO, and now we know one, unprecedented growth, two, unprecedented speed. Nobody grew so fast, so much. Weathers the financial crisis with no major hiccups, which is a factor legitimizing the approach and the party in the eyes of the Chinese peoples, and all of this without becoming a Western economy. So the incentive for China to change is not big. So we, the way the economy works, everybody's happy. Now the question is, did China do good? By good we mean, did China behave in a way, in a WTO consistent Congress way? The bone of contention is the role of state in China. And the majority of complaints centered around two things, the role of SOEs, state-owned enterprises, and transfer of technology. Some people have uh, argued very legitimately, and we cite uh, 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 a lot of the work of uh, Chad Baum here, claims of under-enforcement in China. But China faces less complaints than it should. By what benchmark, we'll discuss this later, Chad is here. But overall, people complain about the role of state in China. Now, even I'm not going to, we'll discuss later if we will have under enforcement indeed or no, but taking into account the disputes we observe, it is clear that China has not behaved worse than any WTO member when it comes to implementation. There is probably a legitimate concern about implementation of one case, but in the overwhelming majority of cases, the Chinese have implemented adverse rules. This cannot be said for other WTO members. Now, implicitly then the argument here already must be, we don't have enough tools to take, to tame Chinese behavior the way we want Chinese behavior to be tamed in the realm of state involvement in the economy. And that brings to the question, can China and the WTO live harmoniously? Andre? No, nothing, nothing to add at this. Nothing uh, to add. I think we better so, be better move forward. Now will come your addition. Why the current regime cannot address the state concerns? When it comes to transfer of technology, now the, the typical complaint is, I am a Western investor, I go to China, for a number, if, it, if there are no woofers, wholly owned foreign enterprises, if you take all these things out, but for a sizable uh, percentage of the economy, I need to have a joint venture with a Chinese private agent. I cannot have the joint venture because the Chinese private agent requests in return transfer of technology. We don't enter into the legitimacy, non legitimacy, as I repeat, of those claims. But the point is this. If we deal with private agents' behavior, the WTO cannot do anything to help you. If the companies in China which refuse uh, a joint venture and agreement, unless if transfer of technology takes place, I'm not saying these things don't happen. I'm saying you cannot do anything against it within the, the four corners of the WTO as it. When it comes to state-owned enterprises, Yes, they could have been handled. There is a little bit of self-inflicted damage here. When we look at the case law of uh, the appellate body, to me at least, and to Andre, of course, 
because you go for the, the book is mind boggling. Uh, it's difficult to reconcile for in both subsidies and Article 17 state trading. Let's start with the simpler state trading. They misconstrue discrimination with price discrimination and they ended up where they ended up. Uh, you read James Smith's idea when negotiating Article 17 GATT, and then you look at the case law, and it is two ships passing by in the night. That's precisely why every FTA after the Uruguay round, TPP is the best example, went back to the original mid idea regarding the, the wording and the disciplines imposed through 17. When it comes to subsidies, quite frankly, they went from black to white to gray shamelessly. A uh, wholly owned enterprise is not suspicious. It's not an element that would at least nudge the judges to say, wait a second here. Why on earth a wholly, why is this company wholly owned? What is the reason for uh, state owners? Nothing. They say, oh, I don't care about those things as long as uh, you behave like a private agent without, of course, inquiring what private agent means because they don't look into trade effects. From then, they went to the other extreme later, saying, even uh, private companies in China, I will uh, look at them uh, suspiciously, and they could be uh, state companies if they have links with the government, but again, without looking into actual conduct and so on and so forth. It's a mess. I mean, I think legitimately a number of people, uh, not only the US, a number of uh, other WTO members and many, many, many academics have expressed doubt about the coherence of the case. Now, I would say to the uh, defense of the adjudicators that they didn't benefit from a clearer legislative mandate because the subsidies agreement does not even mention state-owned enterprises. Andre. Should I continue and you put it all together or it's up to you? No, I just, I just add one word here. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, of the two issues, uh, technology uh, transfers, what some refer to, and we sometimes also refer to in the book as forced uh, technology transfer and the, uh, and the SOEs. And as Petro said, I think very importantly at, at the start, those are not, the, the issues that we have selected, those this is all reading of the uh, of the evidence. It's not our own uh, uh, choice. Now, I think that, uh, I think we agree that on those, of those two issues, in a sense, the the SOEs, uh, if one were to rank them, uh, the SOEs comes uh, first uh, compared to the technology transfer. I mean, we we argue on on both, and we sort of made propose we make proposal that. Petros will discuss now on, on both uh, issues, but in a sense, the SOE uh, gets at the heart of the issue that we identified at the start, this sort of socialist market economy, the role, uh, the role of the state. It's uh, much, much more obviously relevant on the, uh, on the SOEs. And I think this is where, the, in a sense, the structural problem is this uh, liberal understanding uh, is much more exemplified by the SOEs than the technology transfer. And I think when, when we look at solution, uh, I think we need, to, uh, we need to address that even more probably than the, uh, than the technology transfer matter, which is easier in a sense. Absolutely. Now, why doesn't the current regime address the stated concerns? Now, the Uruguay round was um, probably the only, the first and only of multilateral opportunity to address China, but the Uruguay round did not, I'll refer to it in a moment in more detail, address the implicit, no, translate the implicit liberal understanding into explicit language. The Obama administration realized that. And a few years later, essentially, here I vulgarize a bit, negotiated an agreement for China without China, the TPP. And now if you look at the TPP disciplines, for example, on SOEs, and you compare it to the subsidies agreement, it's day and night. 
Now, uh, this is a little, what we say missed opportunity because remember, China makes accessions about noise, uh, makes noise about accessions since 1986. And since 87, there are official negotiations. So the SEM agreement was being negotiated until 1993, knowing that China is about to enter the WTO, and yet, uh, for some reason, the SEM agreement is an agreement between countries like EU, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, not countries like China. Why didn't they do this in the protocol of access? Say, okay, now I have an SEM agreement, which is not optimal, but I have the second opportunity. Second bite on the cake is the protocol of access. But the protocol of access is not open season. Uh, you cannot impose on the protocol of accession disciplines, for example, on transfer of technology, where you don't deal with state behavior and which bind no one in the WTO, only on China. Uh, some activities of SOS could have been handled probably a little bit better, but the long and the short is you cannot, through a protocol of accession, move into areas that will impose a regime change in China. It's, this is not the function of protocols of accession. There is a great book by Peter Williams looking into all protocols of accession up to 2008. And the, the main conclusion of the book is this is a place where you negotiate tariff rates, where you negotiate if you the kind of obligations which can vary, but you don't negotiate extra GATT or extra WTO obligations. Andre. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Now, with this in mind, we say, okay, but is China the only, let's say, outlier who requested the accession to the WTO? No. We start with Japan first. Japan was the first, if you wish, different uh, country which requested accession to the GATT in 1955. And we, we discuss in detail the accession process of Japan. And it was striking to Andre and to myself how a lot of the discussion concerning China was the discussion of the 50s concerning Japan. Actually, China entered the WTO. There was only one WTO member, one incumbent, who uh, invoked non-application. When Japan joined the WTO, there the gap in 1955, a series of even European countries, they invoked the uh, non-application clause. Japan was a ghost member until the mid 60s. And if you look at the negotiation on trade and development, when uh, developing countries were requesting the inclusion of part four, Japan said, if you want me to give you preferences, you must acknowledge me as a GATT member. So in the 1963, 64, Japan was still not acknowledged as full GATT member by a big, big number of GATT members. Hungary, Poland, Romania, Yugoslavia. Ah, sorry, and about Japan, just one more thing. And Japan, of course, changed, not because of the GATT, but Japan became a member of the OECD fast, uh, was under the custody of the US and defense matters. Was, there were some differentiating factors. Centrally planned economies, there were four, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Yugoslavia. Now, these countries were small players with no disrespect, don't mean any disrespect, but small players in the world trading regime. So typically you have an obligation to the effect that uh, they would accept a certain volume of trade, which would be increasing over time. So the WTO and the GATT before had dealt with small players they had dealt with centrally, centrally planned economies. They had dealt with big players, but not centrally planned, but never with a big centrally planned economy. China was a game change. And uh, this time they could not rely on domestic regime change. China did not join the OECD, did not go through the OECD recommendations. Uh, China stayed the way it was. Andre, now I move to discuss how to deal with China. You want to say something at this stage? And then we move because I think it's proper for you to speak now. Um, yes, just uh, uh, I think Stuart uh, was kind enough 
to uh, to emphasize uh, that one of the discussion that we have in 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 the book is the comparison between uh, Japan and, uh, and 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 China, and in a sense, I think uh, as we all remember the clashes uh, between Japan on the one hand and mainly the US and the, uh, and the European Union or the, or the European community at the time, um, I think it was inevitable uh, in a sense that uh, from an economic perspective, uh, there were going to be clashes between uh, China and the incumbent, in particular the United States and the uh, European Union, had there been, as there had been with, uh, with Japan uh, uh, earlier. Uh, obviously, the geopolitics of the relationship between, let's say, the West and Japan uh, is very, very different than the geopolitics of the relationship between the West and uh, and China, and explains uh, some of the uh, of the difficulties that we have at the moment. But the other one is indeed, and I think Petros already indicated that the fact that ten year or roughly ten year after Japan. Uh, joined the uh, the GATT, uh, it did join the uh, the OECD, uh, and that implied a number of changes of behavior in in Japan. Uh, that nonetheless uh, did not mean that they were not clashes. Uh, there were clashes even after Japan joined the OECD, but little by little uh, it uh, it went away. Now. I mean, we never discussed that in the uh, in the book, and because obviously we, it's not something that we believed uh, was uh, forthcoming in 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 the next few years. Uh, China joining the uh, the OECD, uh, but I think that the the element of almost the inevitability in inevitability of the clashes uh, between the West and uh, and China based on the. Japan experience, I think, is is very was very much present in our mind throughout throughout the writing of, of the book. And you know what was different between Japan and China? What is the same and what is different? I think th this is very much this was very much present when we came to uh, to the last part that that uh, that uh, Petros will present. Or, you know what kind of uh, of uh, way forward? So the reason why we wrote this book is because we were not happy with the. There is a problem, and uh, I mean, in the eyes of the major stakeholders, and we don't agree with the uh, um, proposals how to deal with the problem. There is the Daniel Rodrik view, do nothing, WTO is big enough to accommodate all of us. There is the Trump administration approach, take justice into your own hands, WTO cannot help. Jennifer Hillman, in a couple of papers, uh, advances a proposal how to litigate intelligently against China. We disagree with all three. I'll explain why briefly. And with this, I'll finish my presentation. And that's why we wrote the book. Now, if the do nothing approach, first of all, obviously problems persist. And uh, in our view, it is ahistorical. It completely bypasses the liberal understanding of the GATT. Uh, the GATT was not negotiated between uh, uh, players uh, with, with different economic regimes. Yes, some were developed, some developing, but across developing in the 40s, you have countries like Australia. The major uh, stakeholders were the US and the UK. We did a book with uh, Doug Erwin a few years ago, and uh, we had a classification of all GATT provisions. And uh, the way we uh, understand property rights of the GATT, and I haven't seen much against our view, is that 75 out of 89 provision, we subdivide the GATT provisions, come from the US and the UK, and they were reflected in the US suggested charter, which was based on the Atlantic Charter, the agreement between Churchill and FDR. So these people, they come from home is a liberal economy and they negotiate trade between two liberal economies. They're not going to reproduce each and every aspect of the liberal market economy into the trade agreement, but that is the background against which trade liberalization will occur. Take justice into your own hands. I don't need to say much. Um, uh, there is a very nice paper by Amity and co-authors David Weinstein, one of my colleagues here at Columbia University, which suggests that China did not flinch. There is an excellent paper by Chad Baum, 2021, that not only this, but 
China has not delivered on the promise. And furthermore, there is another paper by Gary Huffbauer which says, well, if anyone takes phase one to the WTO, they win because this is managed trade, goes against MFN. For all those reasons, we don't think this thing works. Non-violation complaints. Let's, I would say just one thing, even let's assume that you prevail in a non-violation complaint, which is difficult because as of Kodak Fuji, for any measure which precedes accession, you can do nothing almost about it. You have an insurmountable burden of proof to, that you have to honor. But let's assume you win. It doesn't lead to change in the China market because a WTO member that has lost a non-violation complaint can simply pay instead of uh, changing its policies. And when you talk about China with a huge trade surplus, I don't think it will be too much of trouble to pay. But the fact that we don't have non-violation complaints, I think is proof enough that WTO members do not take this instrument very seriously. Our approach is instead of doing anything else, you should be renegotiating new disciplines, especially as Andres said for SOEs, as well as for transfer of technology. I don't want to get into details here. We can do it during the discussion, but our point is you don't need even to reinvent the wheel here. There are agreements, TPP and the USMACA, sorry for the misspelling here, it is USMCA. Uh, you can mimic CPTPP and USMACA, who have much, much more de detailed disciplines on uh, especially SOEs. Now, of course, China wants to join TPP, as we know, and that will be a very interesting development. So if China is prepared to accept the TPP disciplines, that is probably one uh, already one step forward. And with this, I will stop. But first, I will give the floor to my dear Andre. Thank you, Petros. So I, I will just... Uh, I think you said that you said that the uh, uh, start, uh, what had been the purpose of of, of a book, uh, to identify uh, issues, to give a historical uh, to give a historical perspective, and then to put forward uh, a vision. And the vision uh, is indeed in the uh, in the subtitle of the uh, of the book. Uh, so only multilateralism can can provide. Uh, durable solution to this. Uh, but obviously a question that probably we will have in the in the discussion on that we are often asked, how to bring about the parties, how to bring about China, but not only China, how to bring about the, the various important parties uh, at the WTO uh, to renegotiate uh, some of the uh, some of the understandings, uh, some of the in order to to deal with those issues, in particular the SOEs and the uh, and the technology and the technology transfer. Now it seems to me at this stage and sort of this going beyond uh, the book, uh, I think there are two um, two approaches uh, that uh, are or would be feasible. One approach is what we discussed with Annabelle with Chad. Uh, with Jonathan and, and uh, Richard uh, and Richard Baldwin uh, in in a little paper that we did a few months ago uh, at the start of the Biden administration, in a sense, some kind of common views uh, among the United States, the Europeans, uh, uh, Canada, and sort of other like-minded countries that would bring uh, at the WTO uh, a number of uh, possible solutions. To negotiate with China and with other uh, with other countries, so it would not be imposing on China, but it, there would be a common view, uh, not only transatlantic but beyond, obviously, uh, including with the, with, the, with 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 Japan. Uh, I think that made maybe more sense uh, back in January than uh, po from a political viewpoint than where we are today in uh, in September. Uh, uh, obviously, there's been some disappointment in, in certain quarters, certainly in Europe, uh, about uh, the Biden uh, administration and maybe less hope that this kind of approach can be, uh, can be successful. Then there is another approach, uh, and the two can be complementary, certainly, is what the EU did 
bilaterally with, uh, with China, the CHI agreement, uh, the investment uh, agreement, and now uh, China's uh, application to join the CPTPP. Uh, I think those two approaches uh, and commitment that China seems to be willing to do both bilaterally with, with the EU and uh, regionally in the CPTPP uh, seems to me should be taken seriously as in a science of what, what one can discuss with, with China, what China seems to be willing to commit itself. Um, and I don't think that obviously the solution can be, uh, can be bilateral. The solution needs still to be multilateral, but I think there are signs there uh, by the, those, two, uh, those two moves of China on the CHI and on the CPTPP uh, that seems to me need to be taken seriously as way to reinforce what we are seeking for, which is the, a multilateral uh, solution. Let me stop here. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks very much, Petros and, and Andre, for that um, great presentation. Um, and you, you've you described the book extremely well and set out um, a number of areas where I'm sure our audience is going to have um, questions. I've got a lot of questions myself, but I'm not going to ask them now because I think we need to move on uh, to our discussants. Uh, but just before moving on, um, Lou, can I just ask for a bit of guidance from you on Q&A? Um, uh, yeah, we... uh, yeah, please. Can we, uh, be, um, given the nature of this audience, would it be better for the audiences to, to raise their hand, for members of the audience to raise their hand and then we'll get them to ask the question rather than typing stuff out? Would that be better? Yeah, I think naturally, you know, normally what we do is that they raise their hand and they could just throw out their questions directly, yeah. Okay, great. So there you are. If you want to, uh, you know, make a comment or ask a question, please raise your hand and um, we'll try to queue according to the order in which they, they come in. But straight on to our discussants now. And first of all, Hido, please, you have the floor, Hido. Thank you very much, Stuart. And let me say first uh, what a great pleasure it is for me to be able to comment on Petros and Andre's book. Uh, we go back a long way. Uh, I remember Petros 30 years ago in OECD meetings on competition policy, and Andre also 30 years ago talking about regional trade agreements. So it, it is truly a great pleasure for me to be able to uh, offer some thoughts on your book, which I agree with Stuart, is eminently readable. So it's one of those few books where if you just want to learn about trade from a sofa, I would say take uh, uh, Petros and Andre's book because it reads really very comfortably, which I think is, uh, is always excellent for a subject that is known to be sometimes nerdy for outside people. Now, I worked on China's accession for 10 years uh, from 1991 until 2001. And I got the file because I had the smallest office at the end of the corridor and nobody else wanted it. Uh, because this was shortly after Tiananmen and everybody said, oh, but this file is not going anywhere. Uh, they refer to Napoleon's comments about China, that it was better to keep China asleep. Uh, and so the file fell on my lap and I never regretted uh, the years that I spent working on it. I would also want to say that China's success today is of its own making. We often forget that, but they are an incredibly hardworking people who, in my view, have earned every ounce of their success. Whenever we buy quality goods from China and you look at the seriousness of their value chain, which they built up the supply chain in 10 or 20 years, it's deeply, deeply uh, impressive. Um, I would also say that when we concluded the negotiations in 2001, everybody thought it was a good deal. I remember Pascal Lamy coming to me and saying, Hello, I'm getting all these compliments from ministers, from members of parliament. You did good, you did a good job there. And so now, of course, 50 years later, everybody's saying, Oh, well, you missed so many things. But at the time, I really think it was the best that we can do. Uh, it's important to remember that when we started negotiating in earnest with China in the early 90s, per capita income in China was below $500 a year. They were behind India at the time. 
um, 80% of the Chinese people lived in the countryside, and there was no doubt that China was a developing country. So the fact that we negotiated an average tariff uh, from China, which was just two times the OECD average, was quite a good outcome at the time. It was considered to be smart negotiating. We used this argument saying, OECD countries are around 4%. Why don't you have double 4%? You can have an average tariff of eight. Uh, and at the time, of course, India and other countries had not bound many of their tariffs. And if they had, they were in the 20s, 30s or 40s. So at the time, uh, the market opening in goods was considered to be a good outcome. There were also WTO plus obligations. I remember long fights with uh, Peter Williams. I disagreed very fundamentally with him uh, on this uh, because he felt that we could not ask China to commit to eliminate export duties. And we did. Uh, and it was a good thing that we did. Uh, as uh, Petros mentions and Andre in their book, it's one of the few very clear obligations which have been litigated many times and where the commitment is so clear that it's actually helped uh, the membership find pro uh, uh, trade outcomes. There were also WTO minus uh, commitments for members. So members could give China a WTO minus treatment. And of course, the uh, non-market economy uh, provisions were the most central. And the 16 years was considered by everybody to be exceedingly long. Because in the Uruguay round, the longest transition period is 10 years. So the example everybody had was the longest you can do in the WTO negotiation is 10 years. Along comes the China negotiation, and China accepted the US request to have a 16-year transition period for non-market economy uh, uh, calculations of normal price. Uh, so, um, uh, and I remember right at the end of the negotiations in the 98 or 99, that Kathy Field, the US negotiator, wanted to start talking about subsidies and everybody said oh that's a bridge too far because there was so much work that had gone into everything people said you know we can't we we're not we're not going there and then we as it were concluded the the agreement but what was clear and this response to the point of petros was not that the chinese economic system was an alternative to the western model the assumption of everybody was China will become a market economy. It's a question of time. Uh, these are some provisions we are negotiating for the transition. And China was itself saying, we will continue with the reform process. So there was an ambiguity between this reform process to which they were committed and this, the market economy with socialist characteristics, which they were also, uh, also uh, presenting. The WTO also in the 1990s wasn't very involved in behind the barrier, behind the border uh, issues. So we were mainly looking at market access and then some issues in, uh, in trade defense. Uh, but that was, I would say, 80% of the negotiation. There were very few regulatory, uh, regulatory commitments. Now, how are we today? The way I would see it, uh, the, the, how I always visualize it is I say it's like a golf club. So golf clubs, we all know, I'm not a golfer, but I know how they work. Uh, they've got lots of rules, especially unwritten rules. So you come into the clubhouse and you're meant to wear a suit and tie and the ladies are meant to be well-dressed and there's a certain modicum of formality. And along comes a new member with a completely different dress code. Because that's how I would describe it. Uh, a completely different dress code. They're still playing formally their bills but they have a different dress code. And you have notably the United States at a certain point who say, you're not applying the dress code. You shouldn't be in this club because you're wearing different clothes. And where are we today in 2020 that the US has said to this other member, I'll see you in the parking lot outside the club and we will sort our differences out outside the club in the, in the parking lot. And you have all the, the members looking from the clubhouse onto the parking lot to see how they are prosecuting this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this difference. Uh, and uh, it's not a, a small conflict because it's $265 billion of trade. It's 
25% tariffs. The Chinese are maintaining their market share, which is incredibly impressive. All of our modelists said with tariffs like that, within two years, you lose the market. Well, they haven't. Uh, so uh, that's also very interesting to note in terms of economic uh, uh, competitiveness. Where I think we do still uh, miss something, and this is just something I would like to add to this discussion, is that we often underestimate the macroeconomic dimension of China's trade policy. And the macroeconomics is incredibly important because this is not a consumer driven economy. It's still an investment driven economy. Michael Pettis writes a lot about this. Uh, it, uh, I learned when I was studying economics that if you were a developing country, it was good to have a trade deficit because you were importing capital goods. But you know, from 1995 up until you know five years ago, China just had a trade surplus, uh, even though it was grown so quickly. And so, macroeconomically, we should have been onto that. At least the countries of the liberal West, as uh, Petros describes it, uh, and should have engaged. Uh, China uh, 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 more on that. And I think certainly between 2005 and 2012, there is very credible element, uh, evidence of currency uh, uh, manipu manipulation. And it's true that after Chinese accession, everybody was so tired that uh, there wasn't serious monitoring. And the serious monitoring is only in a sense starting, uh, starting now. I'd like to give four brief examples of where I would uh, also underscore Petros and André's analysis that this is a, a different system to what we are used to in the Western uh, uh, liberal market economies. I was speaking to a Chinese journalist in the 1990s trying to understand how China worked. And he told me over lunch that his newspaper was, uh, was running a loss. And I said, well, how do you deal with running a loss? And he said, oh, well, that's not a problem. We, we phone up the paper company and we tell them to reduce the price of paper. Uh, and then I thought, oh, well, that's, a, that's an interesting way to solve that problem. Uh, but there are more, I think, even more graphic examples. The fact that uh, stock market listed companies from 2016 onwards were instructed to introduce uh, party sales uh, into their stock uh, into their structure is something which I think uh, Western countries should have got onto much more and said, you know, this is a fundamental difference between the way you think about uh, your economy and the way we do, because you're introducing uh, uh, the government uh, into a stock listed company. Uh, a second example is uh, Huawei. We looked a few years ago in Brussels, two years ago, at who really owned the company because the chairman only owns one or 2% of the shares. And the other rest of the shares are owned by the employees, uh, but the employees come together in a structure that is in a sense, an extension of the party. Uh, so all of the analysis about what is a private and a public uh, co company becomes much more, I think, into a gray, uh, into a gray area. I remember going to China with uh, my commissioner at the time, Peter Mandelson, in 2007. And we had a brief, which was basically to say to the Chinese financial services regulators that they should open the market because uh, there were 2% uh, of all of the assets uh, of the banking sector were foreign upon Chinese accession, 3%, uh, sorry, 3%. And in 2008, that had gone down to 2%. And the Chinese regulators answered to us saying, you should still be happy because the market's been growing so quickly that you've still expanded uh, your turnover figures of your, uh, of your banks. And, th and that sort of made me think, well, we really are looking at a different way of, of managing uh, economies. But I think the Chinese do still want to learn and to share with uh, the West. And so the, uh, the narrative that they tend to do too little too late is something that we need to keep on, I think, uh, repeating and conveying respectfully uh, as a means of reducing the trade, uh, the trade tensions. What I would say, just finally a few points, is I think there's a very strong case to make, not just about SOE, SOEs and tech transfer, but also about a new uh, uh, 
offer by China of market access commitments, because the market access commitments it made in the 90s were made for a country that had a per capita income of, let's say, $1,000. Uh, China is now at the level of, you know, the lowest EU member states. Uh, so it is appropriate, I think, for it to have market access commitments, which are commensurate to its level of development. I think you can also ask in services simply that the joint venture requirement is eliminated in its uh, mode three uh, commitments. And if that is something that you can agree to horizontally, uh, it actually solves a lot of the tech transfer uh, difficulties that you sometimes uh, encounter. So I think with some also horizontal uh, proposals, if they are uh, creative, you could overcome, I think, also some of the, some of the, cent uh, some of the uh, stress in the system. Lastly, I would say that the WTO, China is going to stay in the WTO, and so are other, uh, so are other members. So I think it is also incumbent on the membership to realize that we have to accept different dress codes. Uh, that would be my uh, concluding thought. And so in accepting different dress codes, you have to be able to flexibilize the WTO. And the WTO is much too rigid today. If you look at the articles of agreement of the Marrakesh Agreement, this consensus-based approach is flawed. Uh, the, the GATT was never intended to be consensus-driven in that way. I think uh, providing MFN to non-participants is an anachronism in, in, today's, uh, in today's world when you're looking at such big economic uh, partners where it's fair to ask reciprocity because you need it politically in order to get trade uh, agreements uh, accepted by members of parliament. And so the WTO really needs to flexibilize its approach, but keep everybody inside the tent. Uh, so that's just my comments. Thank you very much. And thank you again that I was allowed to offer some comments on uh, Petros and Andre's book. Thanks a lot, uh, Hido. Some great comments there. Um, I could pick out a few, but I'll just comment on the uh, on the golf club analogy, if, if I may, because as a as a former member of the of the golf club de Genève, it it was true that there used to be uh, occasional arguments about dress code, but by far the bigger argument was about the golfing handicaps of the members and whether they were accurate or not. So uh, that's, an, that's an interesting uh, uh, slant on, on what you said. Uh, we must pass on now quickly to uh, Xin Kuan. Uh, Professor Tu, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored to be part of such a distinguished group. Uh, I'm sorry that I have uh, no opportunity to read the book yet. I just had a look at uh, the introduction and listened to the presentation uh, just uh, now. So my understandings about the book might be uh, inaccurate. Um, as I understand it, the main question raised in the book is uh, whether China's state involvement is uh, consistent with the rules and especially the spirits or the gut thinking behind the rules. Uh, it seems that uh, the authors believe that uh, the main issue is that uh, China is not following the spirit <laughs> of uh, market economy as expected. Uh, I think this is a really uh, difficult for, for, for China um, because when we were uh, acceding to the WTO, uh, what we were required to do was to comply with the written rules rather than the invisible spirits. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I don't want to be uh, caught in such a debate. I would like to address this question from uh, another perspective, which is the uh, effect of uh, China's practices, especially uh, the two elements emphasized in the book, SOEs and uh, forced technology transfer. Uh, just uh, shortly, actually. Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, the role of SOEs uh, in China largely focuses on supporting political, economic, and social stability and providing public infrastructure or public goods. Uh, Chinese SOEs have actually contributed a little to China's export growth and the international competitiveness. 
uh, you, you analyzing the share of SOEs in Chinese exports is only 15% in last year. That was uh, 42% in 2001. But anyway, right now it's very, very small. So paying too much attention to SOEs actually misses the real reasons of China's success. Uh, in China, there's basically a consensus that uh, rising efficiency of the Chinese economy results from the decline of the state sector. Um, of course, uh, many argue that uh, Chinese SOEs uh, are actually public bodies uh, 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 or another government uh, hide behind it to support the other company. Uh, this is actually also uh, confusing for Chinese people. Uh, actually, since 19, 1979, China has been successfully separating SOEs from the government in a gradual approach of privatization and marketization. The logic is simply because the government wants SOEs to make money for the government rather than spend the money off of the government. Uh, SOEs, especially central SOEs, have very strong incentive for profits. Uh, most of them heavily compete with private and foreign companies and between themselves uh, in the government, in the market. Uh, and uh, they, are, they are largely commercial entities rather than public interest watch. Actually, inside, inside China, the main dissatisfaction with SOEs is that uh, they are too selfish and uh, too much uh, uh, profit uh, driven and not to uh, not take enough social and strategic responsibilities. So even though uh, I would not argue that uh, SOEs and uh, state-owned enterprises and banks have never provided subsidies or benefits to some companies or industries. They are definitely not altruistic public servants. Uh, even among SOEs, money is more important. Uh, you know, in 2019, uh, six biggest state-owned banks made profits over one trillion. Uh, in countries, the total profits of over 160,000 state-owned enterprises in other industries uh, had only 3.6 trillion profits. So uh, actually, uh, that means that uh, these state-owned banks are profiting a lot from other SOEs. Uh, and also uh, in, in China, many uh, liberal economists have been blaming that uh, SOEs have uh, exploited private companies a lot rather than helped them. So, so, so who are SOEs subsidizing? Uh, that's a question for me. <laughs> um, and regarding forced technology transfer, again, uh, I want to deny the existence of uh, such a phenomenon. I, I think there are some, some cases, uh, although I don't know the details. Uh, but uh, I would like to emphasize is that uh, 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 these practices are really useful or helpful for China's uh, technological progress. Uh, now, uh, you know, the well-recognized, most innovative company in China is Huawei, uh, uh, but it has never established any joint ventures with foreign companies. In fact, the main way of its technological innovation is to establish labs uh, all over the world, especially in the developed world. Uh, another example is China's auto industry. All state-owned auto companies have at least one joint venture. And now you can see the most innovative or even competitive companies are all private companies, such as BRD, Geely, Qirui. Uh, they are exporting uh, cars overseas, but uh, SOEs almost uh, export uh, uh, nothing. And uh, actually, these uh, private companies, they had no qualifications to establish a joint venture, actually. Uh, so again, I, I suppose uh, there are some cases of uh, fast technology transfer, but I don't believe that China's technological progress depend on that. Uh, uh, according to a uh, WIPO's report just released yesterday, China already ranks the 12th uh, most innovative country. Uh, so to conclude, I think um, 
China is still uh, in the process of transition toward market economy. So I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't argue that the China is a full market economy. Uh, although uh, there is no golden standard of market economy. So uh, I believe that there actually there are maybe different mod models of market economy. But anyway, I think uh, China need more marketization. Uh, so, uh, there are, there have been and still are some governmental uh, interventions, uh, which are uh, more often and larger than the, especially the advanced economies like the uh, US and the EU, Japan. But I don't think that those practices cre create inter international competitive advantage for China, if not disadvantage. Uh, and the most Chinese economists believe that uh, China's economic success is likely due to the declining role of the government in commercial activities or to marketization. Uh, we also admit that uh, uh, China's rise is a challenge for the current uh, international system because we have uh, different dress, <laughs> dress code. <laughs> uh, uh, but the key issue is uh, is not the way of China's rise, uh, but uh, the fact, scale, and the speed of China's rise. Uh, I think uh, all of us, including both China and the US, uh, including our, ourselves, I think, uh, need time to to get to get used to it, psychologically and institutionally. Uh, then, institutionally, I think the most recent application of China to join CPTPP is a positive step uh, to show the world that uh, China is willing to narrow the gap between the two sides, between the two models. Um, and especially um, the US has been uh, accu accusing uh, China uh, is, uh, is uh, not following the uh, international the rules-based system. Uh, but uh, I think uh, China's application to join the CPTPP uh, indicates that China is willing to accept the rules even made by the United States. Of course, now it is uh, denied by the United States. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, uh, I, I still uh, see uh, hopes. Uh, thank you, I'm gonna stop here. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Xin Kuan. Excellent. Um, well, we have about um, 20 minutes left, and I think I want to give Petros and Andre the floor at the end, say for five minutes. So uh, we've got about 15 minutes, say, for, for questions. I've received one through the chat from, uh, from Hector Torres, which I'll read out. Um, I think it's everybody can see that one, actually, but I'll read it out. And then... Uh, Hosok Lee uh, Makiyama has asked if, uh, for the floor to, to ask a question. So I'll give Hosok the floor after we've dealt with um, Hector's question. And Hector's question is, uh, I wonder if Petros and Andre are seeing too much of a clear cut difference between SOEs and private owned enterprises. According to Goldman Sachs, government subsidies to private owned enterprises have caught up with those of SOEs. And he says he could share a chart for those interested on that. So I don't know if um, if uh, Petros or Andre, you'd like to say anything about that? Should we respond now or take some questions first? Up to you, Stuart. Okay, well, let's take a few more questions then. Um, so could I um, give the floor to I'll give the floor to Hosuk, and then we have uh, Alan Wolf and uh, Alejandro Hara. Thank you, Stuart, and thanks for everyone. Uh, it's a great presentation and also a great contextualization by Hedo and Professor too. I think. Uh, actually, I just wanted to spin off on the uh, the commentators. Um, well, uh, comments on the uh, on the book, and uh, one thing that struck me when I heard the presentation of the book is the uh, um, the comparison to Japan or sometimes Singapore is also mentioned quite often, and someone who has been 
very closely looking at those systems, I wonder how how far the mileage is of these analogies, because in the end, uh, we do have quite a few, um, let's say, practices that are similar. Uh, Singapore certainly have this its own profit-driven uh, sovereign wealth fund, so has Norway and quite a few of Japan's practices in the 70s and right up to the 80s are sort of in the similar vein of uh, what China is doing. So I, I do really do understand the comparison. But in the end, the, the big differences here, I think, is, uh, first of all, the intention of these uh, practices, uh, basically the policy objective. And the second, which is the scale. And uh, if you diify the rule-based system and consistently talk about it as a rule-based system, I think you cannot address the problem of scale simply through a rule-based system. It is indeed, in the past, a contract system. And you cannot actually have uniform application of the same rules. This is the reason why we have litigation based pillar. And in other words, how far can you get if you talk about consistently focus on the rules? The second question is also a spin off that, which also goes to what Heather was saying, uh, which I think is also very, very important, uh, which is uh, in terms of China's incentive to negotiate. I think it is very well established uh, that China is currently almost entirely non-responsive to external incentives. It has a domestic politics of its own. China is not an alien subspecies of some kind. It, it, they are humans, they have politics, and their politics are very, very similar to Europe and actually sometimes even the United States, if you look at it. So what is the purpose of actually trying to build a coalition or alliance if they are not actually responding to any incentives aside from internal ones? These are a little bit of a devil's advocate questions that I'd like to just put forward because we have now consistently been talking about we should have fist fights in the parking lot. We should build a alliance, the famous word of, in Washington in some parts of Brussels. That, but if they are not really interested in coming to, or it's not even by interest, if they are unable to come to the negotiation table, you just can't. And let's be frank, some of us are in the very similar situation, at least our political appointees. Thanks, Hosok. Yeah, there's a couple of um, devil's advocate type of questions in there. Thanks a lot. Um, now it's going to be Alan Wolf and then, uh, Alejandro Hara, and then Lou has got, a, got his hand up as well. And maybe possibly after that, we'll have to go back to, um, to Petros and, and, and Andre. Alan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry this isn't in person so that I could get in line to get a signed copy of the book uh, by the co-authors. Uh, it really very thought provoking and useful. A uh, couple of questions. One is, uh, what do they make of the commitment or the statements made in the Working Party report on SOEs um, at the time of accession, which Hito had a lot to do with? Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, it wouldn't be covered by the book, but I suspect because it's a recent development, but with CPTPP, um, uh, what do they see as the venue for negotiations? Uh, the trilateral has not moved forward all that much, US, EU, and um, Japan, uh, on a series of issues that seem to be China-centric. The um, CPTPP doesn't have either the US or the EU, and, uh, but will that become a venue for moving forward to deal with the issues that, uh, rather than the WTO, that uh, the, um, the co-authors identify as the way forward. Thank you. Great, thank you, Alan. Uh, Alex. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic presentation. And reading the uh, uh, introduction this morning, I uh, immediately downloaded the book, which I look forward to, to, to read. So thanks, uh, Petros, and thanks, uh, Andrea. Uh, two questions. One, uh, 
one of the frequent complaints about China is a rule of law. Uh, and to, you can say that to some extent uh, to have a rule of law. It's, and particularly uh, the independence of the judiciary is, is a, to some extent, a, 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 a WTO obligation. Um, so I don't know if you have addressed this in your book, but I wanted to raise the point because it's something which is frequently mentioned. And my next point is uh, about, uh, about the process of accession of China. I think that the provisions where China was asked to assume more obligations than other, more obligations than what were seen in the WTO, or in some cases, as he has said, some other provision which are WTO minus, uh, that I think uh, um, did not help the process to continue the process of reform. Uh, no country likes to be discriminated, singularized, um, and, and particularly China, a very proud country, memory 1841 and so on and so forth. Uh, I think that that may have made the process of, of continuing reform more, more difficult in, in China, at least in, in the process of reform in the sense that the, the West, liberal West was expecting uh, or had the expectation of, of, of seeing continue. And this raises, I think, for the future, uh, a negotiation uh, in the WTO uh, about new, uh, better rules in many areas, or new rules, um, and, and so on. And I, I think that, again, it would be a mistake to do those, to make those uh, reforms to the WTO, just singularizing China and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, having special rules for them. I think that to be more multilateral in that respect. So there's a lot of politics here at play. And uh, I would say do not make the same mistake twice. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Alex um, and Lou. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I will be very quick. Uh, I think uh, uh, for me, the most important part uh, uh, of uh, Petros and Andre's book is really the last part, the way forward, which I enjoyed very much reading. Uh, that is how do we resolve this so-called China problem? For me right now, there are two things I think important to, 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 to note. The first thing is right now, up to now, uh, the difficulties for discussion within and beyond the WTO about uh, this China problem is that Many of the things, uh, uh, statements made or, or pro even proposals made are very much blurs the difference between the two systems, the political and economic. And also Petros mentioned this unwritten uh, expectation that China would become a liberal democracy. Or of course, we, in which China uh, is not going into that direction. So that gives very much difficulties for the WTO as a trade organization to deal with this kind of system, especially if it is indirectly touches upon the political system. And the second thing, as I said in the past, that to resolve China problem, uh, you have to uh, uh, put together a kind of positive structure. Uh, you cannot sim simply push for a kind of negative one uh, and wish or Hosika say that China uh, was not responding to, to any of these. And right now this ongoing kind of uh, uh, building up of alliance uh, to corner or to isolate and focus on China, to be frank, I, I don't think it, it, it is going in that way. Uh, on the other hand, we have to be mindful uh, that given the domestic politics, given the difficulties uh, of these uh, uh, issues, that I, I think that China is still very much uh, uh, open for further reform and opening up. And we do see that uh, in many of the uh, initiatives on Kai between China and EU, and also the recent uh, China's application to join CPTPP. So there's a way, there's a political will there. So the, the next thing is how do we deal with that? CPTPP is only a stepping stone. I think naturally everything, even during the process of China's negotiating to join CPTPP, has to be translated back into the WTO, where I think that uh, is the best place to resolve this problem. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thanks very much, Lou. 
Right. Well, let's go back to um, our two uh, initial speakers, um, Petros and Andre. I'm, I'm sorry to dump this uh, blizzard of questions and comments on you. <laughs> I'll have to leave it to you to make of it as much as you can in the, uh, in the time we've got available. Uh, who would like to start? Petros? We can start with Andre because I spoke way too much. Let's start with Andre and then whatever is left. Okay, uh, let me take uh, two or three points and then uh, you make two or three points, uh, Petros. I, I, I will start with the uh, very last point by, uh, by Lou. Uh, and I, I very much, and I think we very much uh, share, uh, share his view. And I think uh, what Hosuk uh, discussed, I think, I mean, the political economy and you know, external versus in, internal uh, incentives. I think that that is right. You know, when when I read the um, first the CAI uh, agreement, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, the EU China, and you know, uh, I've never been somebody much in favor of sort of bilateral uh, agreements. I'm a, I'm a multilateralist, uh, but uh, my reason for giving a positive, and I think there have not been man that many people. Uh, in the trade community, we have given a positive uh, assessment of the of the CAI is precisely because I thought it was a stepping stone. Exactly the word that you use, Lou, to uh, to describe uh, China's potential uh, accession to the CPTPP. Um, it, it's indeed not the external. I don't think that the, the trilateral uh, is getting anywhere. Uh, it's not going to be sort of the united front that is going to confront China and oblige China to, to make a move at, at the WTO. Uh, I think this is not going to happen. I agree with, uh, with Osuk on, on, on that. So it has to come from inside the China, and it has to come from inside China in part for the reason that Ching Kuan uh, described. Uh, there is within China... Uh, on SOEs, or let's call it in general, on the role of the of the state in the uh, in the economy, uh, a very fertile uh, debate, as there is in in uh, in every economy. You know, France uh, has gone up and down about the role of of SOEs. So you know, it's an issue we know in France, right? In, in Europe, different countries that are members of the European Union that have signed up, that are member of the same club, uh, and have more or less the same dress code. As uh, as Hido uh, described in a very um, interesting and you know uh, um, lovely lovely manner, uh, you know they are all the European countries. You know they more or less share the same dress code, but there are there there are differences. And we know that some countries in in Europe and France was one of them, and partly still is one of them, where SOEs play a relatively important role compared to to other countries. But you know the, the, and there's been this this debate internally in, in France. And I think through a framework, which is the EU framework, uh, there's, been, uh, there's also been change in, uh, in France. I think that debate is there in, in China. Uh, and I think that debate needs to be played out. And there are various, uh, various arguments. But I think in the end, yes, I think China is definitely uh, making progress. And uh, adherence to, uh, you know, sort of those bilateral agreements like the CAI, the regional agreement like CPTPP do show that indeed there is that debate in China and progress uh, can be made. But I said, I agree that, you know, this should be seen as a stepping stone. One more point, and because I don't want to be too long, uh, Hector. Um, who has made the point about, uh, you know, is it private, is it state-owned enterprises, uh, the, uh, the issue here uh, about subsidies? And I, I wonder whether there, there's not a confusion, I think probably due to our own uh, presentation and, and discussion of the, of the issues. Obviously, subsidies that are provided by the government uh, to firms, whether those firms are state-owned or whether those firms are private, they're already covered by WTO discipline under the SCM. So the issue uh, that we discuss and that people discuss typically about SOEs is subsidies that SOEs uh, are providing. So it's not subsidies that they are receiving, it's subsidies that they are providing themselves. And this is what is not being covered by the, uh, by the SCM. And this is, I think, what is 
given rise to, to, to the problem. So, you know, it's not a discussion whether SOEs do receive more or less subsidies than the, the, than the private firms. That is an issue that is well covered by a WTO discipline. And this is not at all what we discuss in the, in the book. I just wanted to, to clarify this. Petros? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank both discussants and Stuart for their uh, uh, comments. And then say just two things, and I stop with two things. The first is, um, last year, because of the COVID, I spent last semester in Europe. So I was teaching a seminar with Damian Neven, who is, uh, used to be the chief economist for competition in the EU, on state-owned enterprises in the European Union. And I realized, first of all, the, the, the size, it's amazing how many state-owned enterprises exist in Europe, even though there is a difference. Let's say in Europe is something like 15% of the economy, China is close to 25-30%, according to Pascal Amis numbers. Uh, but having said that, the big difference we I came to grips with is, first of, sorry, there's one more overlap. Even in Europe, SOEs, they don't address public goods. Lufthansa is, would be a state-owned enterprise. They're everywhere. Now, but the difference is what? That in the European Union, there is a competition law which is more or less functioning which constrains the life of SOEs. And this is what is missing in China. And of course, there is no world competition law. Chapter five of the ITO has to be, it's a it's a best endeavors in article 29 of the GATT, please do something along the lines of chapter five. And that's the big problem. Now, the second point is, I think the point made by Alan Wolf was excellent. What would be the value of those commitments? And, um, uh, I tend, I would, be, first, I would be very keen to see a panel discuss these commitments in the realm of legal context to the protocol of accession of China, but hasn't happened so far and nobody has raised those arguments. And my fear is, and this is where I go always back to the institutional dimension, taking into account who the panelists are, could be anyone, taking into account how they are appointed with no institutional guarantees of close to nothing. This type of argument, their legal merit notwithstanding, I'm not disputing what you said, Alan, at all, they're difficult to fly when you have on the other side three trade delegates who 99% of the time, it's the first panel they do. I just finished my data set. It's just amazing. Something like 60% of all panels have done one panel. That's all. And then they go home. And now you expect those guys to think in terms of legal context, I think it is a little bit unrealistic. But the good news is, as of tomorrow, I'm at the IMF for three days, so I can swing by your place and sign the book. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot, Petros. <laughs> Maybe you can swing by my place as well, Santos. Well, if you're if you're if you're in if you're here, if you're in the States, why not? <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not. But anyway, um, well, you know, we've had a great session. There's no doubt about that. Big, big thanks to, to Petros and Andre um, for taking us through the, the book. It's, it's, a, it's a great read, as I said earlier. And also big thanks to Hido and Xin Kuan for, for excellent comments as discussants. Um, unfortunately, we've all had to get used to, in these times, having these rather short Zoom sessions. Um, there are a lot of people out there, I'm sure, who have got questions, who would ask questions if we had a lot more time. Um, but the way things are these days, an hour and a half is about the maximum. So it looks as if we're going to have to wind up, um, which is a shame, but um, understandable in, in, in the circumstances, I guess. I mean, I, impossible to, to, to wrap up or, or summarize uh, this in any way. I, I just note in closing, maybe, that of course the book points to CPTPP as a possible inspiration, particularly in the sense of dealing with the SOE issue. Um, we're now at a situation where China's applied to join the CPTPP. We're going to have to watch very closely how that will play out. I mean, a question in my mind is, is engagement with China in the CPTPP context better than rejection. Uh, that's something I think that all countries will have to think about a lot. 
Uh, can China meet the substantive requirements of the CPTPP? I think there are different views on that. I saw uh, a comment from Wendy in the in the press recently, and uh, I think Henry Gao had another point of view on that. So that's a, that's another debate. Um, and then finally, uh, not least, you know, how will the U.S. react to China applying to join the CPTPP? And the U.S. line so far, the administration's line, seems to have been that the CPP, CPTPP in its current form is not um, an end product that they can just sign up to. So there, there would need to be some further negotiation there. So all of this has got to play out and uh, we'll watch it um, uh, fascinated, I'm sure. So with that, um, uh, do I need to hand back to you, Lou, or shall I just finish now? Uh, yeah, I just uh, want to say two things. First, of course, we should all thank you, uh, Stuart, for your excellent moderation. Uh, another thing I to share with the, the participants is that uh, uh, we as FMG uh, are planning uh, a series of events uh, around MS12 and other uh, trendy issues. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, I think that in the next few months, you will hear from us that uh, about our potential events on industrial subsidies with WEF, applicability crisis, uh, legal aspects of uh, plurilaterals uh, such as investment facilitation and also the uh, uh, trade policy preview uh, initiative we recently launched and the next one is on Russia. So we look forward to your active participation and really uh, your contribution to the discussion which very much enriches uh, our own thoughts uh, as you have done today. So uh, thanks a lot for being with us and we look forward to, to next time. Thank you. Lou, could I just Thank leave you. a final thought? Leave a yeah, final please. thought that maybe on the yeah. FMG program we should have a yeah. debate about the dress code. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. Let's because, do every, that. No, because everybody's wearing something different, you know. I don't think it's quite well. <laughs> Thanks and very don't, much, everybody. Don't forget right. the handicap. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Great discussion. Thanks, Lou, Stuart, Kido, Shinquan, everybody, and every thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Petros. Bye bye. Thank you.